Uh, this is Vinny from Stone Bank. Hello. Hey there, Vinny. We're about to get started in just a minute. Thank you. Hey, Vinny. Good to see you. How's everything over there? How you doing? How's everything? Uh, we're, we're hanging in there. You guys staying busy nowadays? You see these nails? I used to have them. <laughs> we're hanging in. <laughs> All right, Jay, we got you on. You've got me on. All right, and you are unmuted. Uh, it's 4.03. We've got 244 folks on, so let's go ahead. 245, 246 and climbing, but let's go ahead and kick it off. Uh, take it away, Jay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for what we think will be a very informational call. Obviously, uh, Congressman French Hill has been at the centerpiece of the uh, COVID-19 resource uh, work in Congress, and we appreciate the Congressman for joining us today. We also have Edward Haddock from the state's SBA office joining us. And Edward, again, we appreciate the two webinars that you did with us last week. Um, and we recognize that things have changed since last Friday. So we asked Congressman Hill to come on and to give us his thoughts about this latest COVID-19 resource uh, aid that has been passed by Congress so that we can begin to get people to the right places at the right time so that they can get the help that they need. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome and welcome Congressman French Hill. And, and before we get started, anybody who is not muted, uh, other than obviously our speakers, please mute yourself so we don't have back noise. Questions we'll do at the end via the chat feature instead of everybody trying to speak as once. So if you have a question as we go, you can go ahead and type it into the chat box if you like, or go through them at the very end. Congressman French Hill. Well, thanks, uh, Jay and Buckley, for putting this together. I'm glad there's so much interest in it. And uh, a lot of thanks to Edward and his team at the SBA who are working night and day to implement this super important set of policies that are supposed to help not only our, our businesses, but our, our nonprofits as well. And uh, you got a lot of good questions submitted, but let me just mention two or three things before we get into the meat of uh, the uh, loan programs. Uh, employers need to know that they now can defer the FICA for the rest of 2020. So the 6.2% payroll tax paid by the employer may now be deferred for the rest of 2020. That's a way to get cash, uh, keep cash in a, uh, a business. And that's repayable then over two years in 2021 and 2022 in order to keep the Social Security Trust Fund sound. Uh, secondly, if anybody had a business loss that's been taken, realized loss in 2019 or 18, uh, this bill also changed the tax loss carry forward rules back for five years, five years. for any loss in 2019 or 18. Again, that yeah, allows allow you to submit that filing and get a tax refund immediately, a way to preserve cash uh, in the business. So uh, the Congress authorized uh, $350 billion to be distributed through the Small Business uh, Administration Loan Guarantee Program. And uh, for businesses with 500 and fewer employees, uh, that's distributed through our commercial banking system. Uh, both uh, banks, credit unions, and non-bank fintech lenders, such as Square or Cabbage, or a farm member of the farm credit system, all would be uh, eligible once Treasury issues their final rules to help a customer with one of these payroll protection loans. Another common question is, what if I'm self-employed, like I'm a barber, uh, or I lease a chair in a barber shop? So the way the law was written, and it's a, definitely an expansion of typical SBA lending, 
an independent contractor, a sole proprietor, someone who's self-employed is eligible for one of these loans. And also our nonprofit sector, if you have a 50C3 designation, nonprofits are also eligible for uh, these loans as well. And so I don't wanna dominate the conversation, Jay, we might ask Edward to kind of walk through the parameters of both the uh, 7A loan that's up to $10 million or the express loan that's up to a million, if that's a good way to spend our time. I know there are a lot of great questions. So Edward, obviously since uh, last Friday, things changed on uh, the SBA side as well, beyond the economic injury a disaster loan program that we, we talked about last week. And again, for those of you that were not part of that, uh, if you go to our uh, website, the Little Rock Chamber or www.littlerockchamber.com on the front page will be a COVID resource guide that will then lead you to all of this information, all of the applications associated with what we know at this moment in time. And, and actually we have a webinar um, online that we did with Edward and with Rick at the SBA last last week that can outline a lot of the economic injury loan program aspects. But now that we've moved to the Paycheck Protection Act portion of this with the newest legislation, Edward, can you give people uh, a perspective of how they can move forward and access that now through their existing banking relationship? Yeah, sure, Jay. Th thank you again to you, uh, Buckley, and the team over at the, the Chamber and, and French. Thanks for coming on uh, with this. Uh, obviously, from an SBA's perspective, that's where I'm going to be speaking today. So um, I I'm going to be putting some breaks uh, onto a, a lot of our listeners right now um, as we move forward with this. I know everyone's ready to move on to the, the next phase or the phase three uh, that has been signed into law. Uh, but uh, there's, I think, a delay in implementation, and that's what uh, I, we're working on now within the administration and make sure we get cleared through Treasury uh, in order to implement all of these systems fully and have them ready for the user. Uh, so I just want to make sure that we're setting that expectation and saying uh, right now, uh, no bank is issuing uh, these these payroll protection loans as of today. Uh, we're waiting uh, and working, SBA is working diligently to get those out and, and the guidance and policies on that uh, to make sure that we've onboarded the lenders and have the lenders prepared adequately to roll these out. I know, um, and, and French could probably speak to the, the timing uh, of what uh, was authorized for SBA to get this together. I think it was 15 days, if I'm not correct. Uh, it is, but Secretary Mnuchin says that uh, this specific direction and the rules he wants out by this coming Friday. So we should get written guidance on uh, those particulars uh, for both the 7A product and the Express product by Friday. And I, I know I was on a call with the headquarters team earlier today, and, and they are at working diligently to get everything moving in the right direction. I think we saw the big change uh, on SBA's EIDL application site uh, this morning, uh, where there's a new application portal available uh, and, and up for those EIDL loans. Now, this is uh, there's two, two parts of the EIDL now that uh, gives a, another tool for those small businesses to use. So obviously, the EIDL applications that we've been taking since last week um, are still eligible. Those are still available to the small businesses. Uh, they can apply directly uh, to the SBA for those and they will be dispersed from treasury to the individual borrower. Uh, with that now is the idle advance loan, uh, which is the part of the authorization of the CARES Act that gave the uh, advance of $10,000 out to the businesses within three days. Uh, so that becomes part of the idle product and that's what uh, a loan directly from the SBA through that EIDL application portal uh, authorizes and is eligible for. So that kind of uh, reinforces and ensures up the SBA IDL. Uh, in addition with that, there's other provisions there that removes uh, any collateral requirements from the borrower uh, on those, those loans and also um, removes um, the uh, personal guarantee from those uh, as well in that um, idle 
loan direct from the SBA. Uh, additionally, the next phase, and as what we are waiting on in guidance, is using our existing lenders uh, for SBA, that's the 7A and the express lenders that we have to really exponentially increase SBA's ability to get capital out to the borrowers. Um, so, uh, for instance, in Arkansas, we've got 23 SBA Express lenders that are headquartered here uh, with out of the 98 banks that we have in the state. Uh, so all 98 banks have a 750 agreement, which allows them to do SBA lending or uh authorize and disperse 7A loans. So we shouldn't see much of a delay in their ability to offer these products in their institutions as soon as that guidance is issued from SBA. Within that, there, there is going to be those loosening of the underwriting and credit requirements that you're normally used to when you talk about an SBA product. Uh, generally, it's a slower process and, and it takes a, a bit more uh, due diligence for um, assessing a factor we call credit elsewhere, which is making sure the business uh, doesn't have any available credit access elsewhere. Well, that removes the factor in, in these loans as well and allows the, uh, the lender to speed up that process and get loans out to the bank. Um, so those are a couple of the new factors that these are going to be available for. Now, uh, with the increased guarantee, traditionally SBA guarantees are at 50% or 75 to 80%, depending upon uh, the, the product and, and the amount. Those will be increased under this, uh, this law, this legislation that's out in order to give 100% guarantee for those lenders so they can uh, hopefully uh, feel more comfortable underwriting those and getting those out as quickly as possible. Um, so that's some of the aspects that we have from the direct, the, the lending side. Now, these, these loans that we'll be working with our partners on are still guaranteed loans. So they will be coming direct out of the, uh, the lending institution to the borrower and not directly from SBA. Let me add uh, to that excellent presentation two other uh, key points. One is that um, these loans for the period between February 15th, 2020 and June 30th, uh, 2020, which is basically the application period for the loans uh, through the banking system, approximately eight weeks of that is uh, forgivable. And this has created, I think, confusion for people. You can borrow more uh, to cover expenses and needed uh, materials at the 100% government guarantee between for your expenses between February 15th, which was the commissioning date of this act and June 30, but about eight weeks are what's considered forgivable. And that's why the act says the loan may be forgiven. Don't read that to be critical. Read that to be that if you borrow more than eight weeks of payroll, rent, uh, utilities and things of that nature, that only eight weeks of it's gonna be treated as a forgivable loan. The difference will be maintained as a 100% guaranteed SBA loan on the bank's books with six months of deferral on payments uh, and then would convert, you could pay it off, there's no prepayment penalty uh, when you're back in strong business. But if you don't, it reverts to a 10-year loan at, at 4%. So, and that's between you and, and the bank. But I want people to understand that basically this forgivable concept that they've read about is for eight weeks of uh, that you pick, uh, you the business design what that is. If your business was clicking along fine until the weekend of March 15th, and you wanna set your period from March 15th to May 15th, and look at that, that's uh, appropriate. Uh, if you have lots of cash flow and you wanna do this in arrears, you could apply for this loan you know, in June and look backwards and, and get the uh, capital flowed in and then get that forgiveness. Uh, this is just an important set of cash flow decisions for each management team to, to think about. Um, the last thing I'd say on a, another benefit that the SB's, SBA has put in place in this program, which I've never seen in my life. I've been in banking for uh, basically 40 years and this one is uh, amazing to me. If you have an existing SBA loan a 7A loan, a 504 loan that's outstanding, that's been outstanding for some period of time, successfully placed uh, either direct with the SBA or uh, through the banking system, uh, that loan's payments 
aren't deferred. Instead, the SBA will make the next six months payments, principal and interest. So that's a tremendous cash opportunity for those businesses who are partially levered now with a uh, an SBA loan that qualifies. So those are just, I want to talk about forgiveness because Edward and I are getting a lot of questions about that. I know the sensitivity of it. And then also talk about this uh, payment process the SBA is offering to its existing customers that really has not gotten much publicity at all. And I'd invite Edward to comment on, on those two points. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think what, what you, really the communication is, is out to our lenders. We're communicating with them uh, as much as we can actually on a daily basis in order to help inform them uh, about what is available uh, to them and to their existing uh, customers. I think, uh, French, though, you said it well, this is unprecedented. Uh, I know the SBA loan volume that we've been dealing with uh, from a direct standpoint is uh, absolutely phenomenal. And I think reset SBA's uh, core calculations on really what what was going to happen when they declared all 50 states and U.S. territories under this declaration uh, and, and saw the loan volume creep up from what was a legacy IT system that was operating under a state or county by county declaration base is now to the national perspective that SBA has to be able to not only uh, facilitate applications, but underwriting these loans as well in order to get them out to the community. So I know there was some uh, hiccups in that idle process in the beginning. And I think as we move through this, this is gonna be a learning process along the way, not only for our lenders that are doing the program and implementing the new legislation and guidance, but also the borrower saying, I'm not sure exactly how this is going to apply and when I need to be doing what. Uh, and there's a lot of indiv individuality in that decision, just like in every one of our businesses, um, they're unique businesses. Everyone has their own strategy that they're implementing. Everyone has their own management style. And so when you see these programs as what is eligible, and I, uh, again, I'm, I'm glad the congressman commented to that, it may be looking back at this and saying, you know what, I need to look at what had happened and see where that might be eligible instead of saying, I need it right now. Obviously, those businesses that have a need for capital immediately, we do have the idle loan program and we have the existing lenders set up to help facilitate and speed up that, that capital access. But there's a lot of businesses who are out here who are worried about, hey, uh, I just wanna make sure I get my turn in the queue uh, and I wanna make sure I'm available and it's available for when I do need it. So I think there's some good points there. Of, um, SBA's loan application is open now and, and individuals can start applying now for this idle loan. Uh, that's fantastic. If you get approved for it, doesn't mean you have to take it but it's available for you there uh, and for you uh, to, to move forward. And if uh, and when CARES is, is completely uh, implemented and that allows you to work with a, your traditional lender or a lender you're usually working with, that gives you more options down the road as well. Hey, Edward, especially because of some smaller businesses that we were visiting with earlier today, uh, a question came up about the emergency grant on the idle loan that would that would allow for the request of an up to ten thousand dollar advance can you walk through that real quickly because a lot of those people may be on this call as well yeah absolutely so that that's part of uh, again the, the the new implementation of the cares act where uh, traditionally and, and what we had was the idle loan application and the business would go in and submit what started out as a pretty lengthy process in order to submit an economic injury disaster loan. Uh, well, due to that volume, SBA said, well, we've got to really streamline this and close down that online application process and went to um, for about a weekend and a day was that download, fill out the form and upload it into a Dropbox application site so it could manage shutting down a legacy site and turning on a new site. This new site is anticipated to be the soft launch of the, the platform moving forward. Uh, what that will do is, again, anyone that had an application in and you got your application number, you're in the queue. SBA will reach out to you as soon as uh, your loan comes up for decision. 
Now, for anyone that didn't get a loan in by that point, go ahead and put your application in. And what will happen is your application will be processed and it will be either approved or sent through the option. And SBA will send that borrower an email saying, would you like the option of the immediate uh, advance $10,000 payment? Then that will go back in for a second decision uh, for then a final decision and SBA will disperse the funds within three days after that. Uh, so that's the process we're looking at right now. I know it was, um, it, since the economic injury disaster loan normally does not have the advanced distribution process on it, that had to be added into this as SBA is moving forward, uh, taking these loan applications. So uh, now that borrower should be able to work directly into that loan application process. And as they get a response from SBA, select if they want the advance payment and then move through the queue that way. They won't be moved out of the queue uh, if they request or if they don't request that payment, they'll still be in the same place in the queue. Okay. Question though. And, and that goes back to what we were talking about and what, what the Congressman said just a few minutes ago, and that is apply, get in there and apply for what you think you might need. And then uh, obviously you can sort it out as, um, as approvals come down the line. Congressman, anything else in that regard? No, I think uh, I think that's a pretty good overview, um, definitionally, and the structure and sort of what the philosophy is. So I think there were so many. Buckley got so many great questions, and we may have more from the listeners. I think if we go to the questions, we'll really be responsive to the group. Okay. All right. Uh, and we now have we we've had a number of folks that weren't in on the very beginning. We're now up to two hundred and ninety-one. Uh, that are watching on Zoom, plus some more on Facebook. And for everybody watching right now, we are streaming this to Facebook Live. So if anybody wants to go back and review after this is done, you'll be able to do so via the Chamber's Facebook page. It'll be posted on there permanently. So um, I'll just start going down the line on these questions that were emailed in advance. Uh, and once we go through those, I'll address the ones that have been added to the chat feature. Uh, so any idea when the money will be allotted to the companies to get some relief? The time question. Yeah, I'll take a stab at that. Secretary Mnuchin has uh, basically directed government to get the rules uh, using this money out by this coming Friday. And as Edward has pointed out, the distribution of the money is from our banking system, our uh, credit unions, our farm credit system, and fintech business lenders out to their customers. So that's why I think talking to your loan officer and thinking this through and getting your numbers in place about here's my payroll, here's my utilities, here's my fixed payments, my mortgages, um, and getting that kind of information prepared is so important this week because this Friday, if we get that kind of information out to all of our financial institutions, next week will be a very busy time and then because these are 100% guaranteed loans by the SBA, I would think the dispersal process and the loan approval process should be pretty straightforward in our institutions. So I would say, uh, you know, including this week, uh, since we don't have that specific direction, I'd say over the next three weeks, you'll see uh, the ability to meet with your banker and fund, uh, uh, fund these uh, loans into your accounts. That's also similar to the amount of time that the IRS is telling us that they will be uh, sending out the tax rebates to all Americans who are uh, have a social security number. So this major funding from the CARES Act will be forthcoming over this next three, three weeks. And then it's available longer, but for those who are really eager to move forward, I think it'll be next week will be a major week. Great. And then uh, I'm assuming that's about the same timeline for knowing specifically uh, which banks are approved banks to, to be able to deal with these transactions. Uh, that, several questions on how, to, how do I know that uh, my particular bank qualifies? Well, Edward, Edward did a good job mentioning that he's got a 750, which is a government bureaucratic dis descriptor, <laughs> but he's got an agreement now from, um, you know, basically all the banks. Yeah, and we 
We've had them. We've had them lined up. You know, I, I think one thing when we look at SBA lending traditionally, you know, uh, there's banks that that get it and really incorporate it as a strategy, uh, and and we have banks that haven't. So um, you can go out to our website and you can um, download a, a copy of the resource guide, the SBA resource guide, and it pretty much lists our active banks. Uh, but out of the uh, 90, 98 institutions we have in Arkansas, we have an agreement with all of them, and we're actively working with them to make sure that they're completely ready to roll this out and they're supported from a banking perspective as well. And let me, let me thank uh, Edward's work and Lori at the Arkansas Bankers Association and all of our bankers who for the last two weeks have been trying to get out ahead of this curve knowing that we would have this key major initiative to get funding to our businesses through the banks. They've all been working cooperatively to get that basic information to the SBA so that they can pull the trigger, quote unquote, when they get the rules and regs out at the end of this week. All right. Uh, and and this, you, you touched on a little bit, nonprofits. Uh, one of the questions was, uh, not just on availability of nonprofits, but specifically community healthcare outreach organizations. Uh, are these grants available? And, and the answer is yes, they are. 501c3s uh, can apply for these. And, and if those outreach organizations happen to be 501c3s, then yes, they qualify. I'll add one, one quickie on that, just if we sure. have some nonprofit executives uh, in on the call. If you're in the arts and humanities space, uh, the bill authorized some additional funding and supplemental appropriations down to the state humanities councils to try to help our local humanities and arts organizations weather the next couple of months. And then likewise, the Department of Justice has set up a grant, a very significant increase in the uh, grant funds available for police and fire uh, these are, and our, our policemen and firemen know these programs, but those dollars were plussed up. And finally, uh, and the Mayor Stodel is on the call, he, he knows about this quite well. The CDBG program was plussed up to try to help uh, our cities uh, who are under stress right now, particularly as they deal with our homeless population that may have uh, the disease. So there's actually quite a bit of nonprofit support that'll come out through the bill but uh, we invite people with questions just to go out to our website at hill.house.gov and we'll try to answer them on those more specifics. Thanks. All right, and this is a pretty specific question uh, for a lot of very small businesses. This particular person says they have only eight employees. They wanna keep them all. Payroll is crucial at this point. Will my business be from sick pay with such a small number of employees? What, what was... The <laughs> what, yeah. what, sorry, what was the question about sick pay? Yeah, it was it was asking, given that the person has so few employees and obviously with uh, you know chance of someone getting sick, well, yeah. you know, I'm not sure I, I follow the question uh, as it relates to this in particular. I imagine it says, will my business be exempt from sick pay? Oh, uh, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, well, this was a big issue two weeks ago when the House and Senate passed the second CARES Act bill, in it, there was a family and medical leave provision so that families didn't have to pay for the test, they didn't have to pay a copay for coronavirus, and that they get some sort of funding if they're home with their kids from school. Uh, and so there was a, a requirement for businesses with more than 500 employees to offer paid family medical leave connected to COVID. But what the Congress did is they said, hey, large business, you can have that, we're gonna, we're gonna ask you to pay for it, for these people to be off for quarantine or off for taking care of their kids, but we, we will reimburse you through your part of the FICA account. So essentially the federal government is going to pay for that. For businesses, small businesses, under 50 employees, they still had the requirement, but we, changed that before President Trump uh, signed the bill and made it uh, much more flexible. And if you do incur a, a, a family or medical leave illness account, the government is going to help those businesses pay for it, even the ones under 50 employees. 
So I would visit with your accountant on that. Again, if you've got specific questions, you can uh, email us at hill.house.gov on that. We'll try to get a more specific answer out for you. All right. Next question. If a business has a loan through this program to cover payroll for the next two and a half months, will that business be prohibited from making distributions to the owners for the next year and a half after the loan is made? I would say no, if your business is under 500 employees, uh, the limitations that you've read about, about the payment of dividends or uh, certain compensation standards or stock buybacks and things of that nature, the direct lending program through the exchange stabilization fund where they're doing uh, major credits secured credits that there is liability for, uh, for over 500. So if you're using the 7A program or the express loan program, I, I don't anticipate you having that limitation, particularly when you have people who, uh, if you have a pass-through entity, you've got to distribute money to yourselves to pay, obviously pay the income taxes that are due. All right, and uh, this might be a question better suited for Edward. Businesses are nervous that they need to be in line with a lender to ensure that they're able to obtain money from the expanded 7A loan program. Yet lenders don't have an application yet. Do businesses need to be concerned that others will get in line in front of them and uh, may be left out in the cold when the funds run dry? Yeah, I, I think we kind of addressed that at least initially. Uh, I, you know, I don't necessarily foresee, um, and and French could probably speak to this. I think uh, the, the bill is sizable enough to to really uh, impact uh, the the current situation that we have going on. I don't really foresee the end of these funds anytime soon, uh, and it wouldn't necessarily say it's it's a rush. Uh, uh, first, take care of your, your employees and, and those that work in your businesses, protect them uh, from the virus. And then two right now, definitely make sure you get your financials together. And as soon as you can get them together, move towards action. Uh, but if you don't have a good understanding on what your current expense and overhead is, then it's going to be hard to move through the application process. All right. And then this is uh, probably again, Edward, this is the definition asking about the definition in the application of payroll costs, whether that includes payroll taxes and benefits or if it's just wages. It, no, it includes everything. And that's that's in the application. It, it defines that as well. All right. And then a question. No, it doesn't. I'm sorry. I don't know. Somebody spoke. Yeah, so in, in the application, you'll, you'll see a, po a portion in there where it asks for your payroll and those costs incurred. Uh, and as, as French also uh, said, you're going to want to get an understanding of all your, your liabilities that you have upcoming each month and make sure that's in there. Now, if there's not a specific space for it, there is an open uh, data space where you can go ahead and make annotations or make notes to your application and substantiate if you have other expenses that aren't listed in there. So make sure those go into your application uh, if you're applying directly for the EIDL or make sure you have those aggregated so you can work directly with your lenders for those applications. Let me, let me read this again. Uh, uh, payroll, existing interest payments on mortgages, rent, leases, utility service agreements. Payroll costs include employee salaries up to the annual rate of $100,000. Hourly wages and cash tips. People were very concerned in drafting this legislation to cover tipped workers because of the restaurant industry. Paid sick, medical leave, group health insurance premium. So uh, it doesn't specifically mention payroll taxes in here, but I also reported to you earlier that the employer portion of payroll taxes is now deferred. Um, but to Edward's point, I would include it you know, in the application as a, as a payroll related expense. Hope that's helpful. All right, thank you. Uh, this one is about 401k plans. What are the particulars for employees accessing their 401ks during this period without penalty? So the bill, the CARES Act specifically waives, <coughs> excuse me, specifically waives any withdrawal from the 401k plans from the 10% uh, withholding. I mean, the 
you know, withholding penalty. And I think it's through 1231-2020. And something really important for uh, retirees that are over 70 and a half years old, uh, the bill also fully waives the required minimum distribution, the RMD, from a 401k plan or self-directed IRA. Uh, so with the volatility in the markets, the Congress wanted people to not have to worry about having to take the RMD at an excessively high valuation on 1231-19. So that's waived for 2020. All right. I'm reading through the chat questions now. I've got a few that we have already covered. All right, on calculating payroll costs on the loan amount and for forgiveness, how will one how will the one hundred thousand dollar limit for a given employee work? Well, it's, it's my understanding that's how the hundred thousand, yeah. I guess, works into the entire calculation. If if somebody makes one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars, that's their payroll, then they're able to turn in and count towards this loan a hundred thousand of the one hundred twenty five thousand. They're not, they're not not including the employee specifically because they're paid more than $100,000. It's actually, you can only include up to $100,000 in per employee compensation, basically. All right, and this is another uh, question for Edward. Uh, a company that has already submitted their application for the economic injury disaster loan, uh, now that there's a new streamlined process that they need to resubmit, or how do they handle that? No, uh, SBA will, will reach out to you once your application has been processed via email. They're, uh, from my understanding, they should have uh, emails coming out by Wednesday of this week on those that have already applied to let them know what step they are in the process and if they need to select the uh, advanced payment feature. So uh, expect sometime this week to get an email if you've got your application already in uh, as an update to that application status. All right. So the eight week forgiveness only applies to the payroll protection loan only, correct? Or does it apply to the IDL loans also? So there is a, a provision in, in the EIDL payroll loans that uh, looks to forgive the 10,000 advance payment. Um, and that is based on substantiating those payroll costs. So the intent of this is, again, keeping uh, individuals paid and, and going back to the small businesses. Uh, and so that uh, there is an option there in that EIDL, if it's also refinanced with any existing EIDLs, that that 10,000 advance payment can be uh, relieved or waived as well. All right. And then on the same topic of EIDL, here's someone who says, I've heard that if businesses can't get the EIDL advance $10,000, that they're not eligible for the PPP loan. Is that true? No. So yeah, French, would you like to address that one? Because I know we've got a lot of questions about double dipping and, and yeah. uh, bearing. What I've been told is you may apply for the $10,000 loan and it'll be netted in your PPP loan. So <clears throat> let's say you're gonna borrow a million dollars in the PPP loan, your, your proceeds there would be $990,000 if you got a $10,000 uh, emergency loan. So you, you're not double dipping, but you can, essentially get both. Uh, in other words, you can, you just can't double count it. You wouldn't have a million dollars and 10,000. You'd have 990 from the express loan and 10,000 from the emergency loan. All right. Which brings up, you know, that brings up sort of a, a related point now that Mike Preston and Governor Hutchison have announced some, you know, bridge loans directly uh, from state funds, uh, if you get one of those, you're still eligible to apply for a PPP loan. There's no prohibition if you've borrowed money uh, through some state bridge loan process. All right. Uh, one of the questions is, can you talk about the financials that will be uh, taken into account for these loans, collateral, credit scores, taxes, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, SBA is using uh, primarily credit score driven underwriting at this time. Um, 
they are uh, really asking the individual to substantiate their overhead fixed expenses and using that credit score model as a uh, gauge in order to distribute the loans. If you have acceptable credit, you should, and uh, SBA is working to ease as many of those um, restrictions as possible. So uh, originally when this rolled out, you had uh, the 4506 and, and a personal financial statement and a bunch of other government forms that were required. Now those are now waived in order to simplify this. Uh, SBA traditionally has taken credit where credits or uh, collateral or collaterals available. Uh, they're not looking to take collateral on these and they're waiving the personal guarantee on these now as well. All right. Will there be any negative impact for applying directly with SBA other than our administrators? I can't foresee a negative impact for applying directly to the SBA as from their administrators. Right. Okay. No, there, there's not going to be any negative impact. Uh, again, uh, making an application into SBA puts you into the queue, gives you that uh, option uh, to take any SBA funds as needed. And then again, uh, if you're going to go out and apply directly to your lender, um, as, as you can see, you have both of those options available for you. There's no, no negative impact though. Okay, great. So let's scroll right through a few more here. Here's a question uh, regarding the 10,000 advance. I've read that the uh, $10,000 advance is forgiven if EIDL is not later is later not approved. Correct? Is it is the 10,000 forgiven if EIDL is approved? Uh, the EIDL 10,000, uh, let me see if I can get uh, something on that. If you want to go to ne uh, next question, I'll grab some additional information on the, the waiver of the 10,000. Sure. Uh, and to the person asking about, uh, they submitted their EIDL application yesterday via the Dropbox method. Is my application still good? And, and the answer is, has been covered as yes, it is. Yeah. Should be contacted by the SBA uh, to, to make sure you can get to the streamlined version of the application. Will a non SBA approved bank be able to help our customers with the PPP? I would answer that question, you know, as a general answer, yes. Uh, once the Treasury's rules and regs are out, and as uh, Edward has noted, all the banks in Arkansas have taken that initial step to get their positioning in order with the SBA. Edward, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, absolutely. And I, uh, I think they're also looking at additional provisions through FDIC in order to make sure even banks that aren't on with the SBA uh, would, would have some ability to use the Pay Payroll Protection Act uh, and, and do these loans as well. So we're waiting for guidance to find out uh, exactly how that's going to be implemented for our lending partners. And I just would repeat in case that person's new to the call, Buckley, this is uh, fintech lenders like Cabbage and Square are going to be authorized. Uh, federally insured credit unions are gonna be authorized. And then the farm credit system uh, banks are gonna be authorized as well. So we, we try to reach, we're trying to reach every nook and cranny of the, of the business lending market with this product. All right. So let me uh, let me let me go back to to the the ten thousand and uh, what we do have guidance on or at least what is written is the rolling in if you do get a a, a PPP loan on that that ten thousand initial payment would be rolled back in uh, I do not see any guidance on if it will be forgiven for the long time if you're denied an EIDL application uh, so I assume SBA will be uh, advising additional guidance on that as they move forward. And we can update you as soon as we get that guidance, hopefully by the end of the week. All right. Uh, 
Do we upload the application and wait for the banks to contact us or should we contact banks directly? So uh, I would say uh, on that one, uh, right now the banks aren't authorized to make these loans immediately. We're waiting for additional guidance for that to come in. They can contact and make a direct loan to the SBA. They should get a hold of their uh, lender and make sure they have communication open with their lender and, and just be in line with that communication of the expectation when these do go, those businesses have already established the relationship, they've already established the dialogue, and they know what they need to have prepared in order to, to start submitting a loan application through that lender. All right. Brent, do you want to add any, anything to that? That was, okay. that was perfect. All right. Uh, someone's asking about uh, the PP, PPP loan being applicable if all they have right now are interest payments because their uh, their mortgage payments have been uh, put on a 90 day hold. So they're still paying interest. Can they apply it simply to the interest? I would say yes, but we'll get we're going to get specific rules. But from reading the text. Uh, interest on a fixed obligation that was incurred before February 15th is something that qualifies for a PPP loan payment. Any chance, uh, and this would be for a follow-up bill, but any chance of 501c6 organizations being added is that question submitted by Jay Cheshire? It was not. <laughs> it was from a chamber individual. <laughs> you, know, you know, Congressman, that my, I was unmuted and I did not ask that question. <laughs> I, I was, I for, for our uh, 281 or whatever it is, listeners, C6s are things like our Convention and Visitors Bureau here, our Chambers of Commerce. They were not included in the bill. That has been, uh, I would say, controversial around the country. So we'll see. Uh, it was discussed, and it was, you know, proactively not done. Um, there is this hundred and fifty billion dollars of funding that goes to the state and local governments in this bill. Arkansas is guaranteed to receive no less than one point two five billion dollars uh, that will come to the governor. It is very open ended how that money may be spent. Uh, obviously, the governors are concerned about the revenue hole. Uh, in their states from sales tax and, and income tax and lack of economic activity. So that'll be of concern. But governors in some states could use that money, in my view, from reading the act to be supportive of local government. Part of local government, of course, is supporting things like convention and visitors bureaus and things of that nature. So we'll see if it comes in a, in a future bill. But as of now, there's no direct way for a C6 organization to tap these funds. All right, uh, and this is a question for someone asking for some clarifications. Do I understand correctly that the small business has to have go a good credit rating? Uh, yeah, right now, yeah, SBA is still using credit scoring in order to approve the loans. Uh, how, what good uh, is, is, is subject to change. And I think that's as SBA is going through this is really reanalyzing and looking at uh, the borrowers that are coming in and trying to extend credit to the full extent possible. Um, SBA is, is widening its guidelines as, as much as possible from both the borrower side and the lender side to make sure we can help facilitate liquidity as much as possible. Uh, there are no firm credit scores that we're giving out or, or identifying as approved or denied under those basis, but SBA is doing everything it can to extend credit out to the most most borrowers that apply. All right. Uh, and then this one, I think I can answer. If we're planning on applying for the PPP loan, sh we shouldn't worry about the COVID-19 EIDL. And I would say that your answer is apply for everything and, uh, and see what you actually get accepted for, right? Uh, that would, yeah, that, that would absolutely be a way to go to make sure you have uh, an application in the queue and, and you're also communicating with your, your lender. Right. 
uh, and someone else asking, does the business have to be shut down? If you're still doing business, can you apply? And yes, you can apply regardless of, of uh, what stage, whether you're shut down or still operating. If you've got losses, then, then go ahead and get your, your application submitted for either of these uh, two. Loans. You know, we mentioned uh, sole proprietor, self-employed. We were thinking specifically about all the massage therapists and uh, PT and OT people and uh, barbers and beauticians out there that we had to let shut their <laughs> office in Arkansas last week. Very frustrating. They're eligible. But one thing I didn't mention is franchises. And so this issue of over 500 employees or under 500 employees, if you're a franchise business, even if you're part of a much bigger organization, the bill uh, has it at the unit level. So one McDonald's is a business unit that could apply even if it was part of a much larger organization, if it's a franchise. I really expect specific clarification on that, Edward, on Friday, because that's a little vague in the bill. And yet I know that's the intent of Congress is to break that 500 employee cap down and not aggregate people. So if you have five car dealerships and you've got uh, way more than 500 employees, but no individual dealership has 500 employees. I know that it's in the intent of Congress to look at that dealership by dealership, for example. So we're going to wait, need to wait till Friday to see Treasury's guidance. But I think that's an important point for people in the food service business and other franchise businesses. All right. And Edward, here's one that we got quite a bit, uh, a lot of discussion on our webinars about the EIDL loans. I have three different S corps with the same ownership percentages and the same owners. Do I file as one loan or different loan applications? So as, as a business entity, if you're going through there and I haven't uh, been able to see all the way through the new application site, if it doesn't give you a chance to list affiliates and these are specifically very different entities, uh, then I would go ahead and make three separate applications based on those. So it's kind of a change from what we talked about last time. Uh, but if, if they're all affiliated and they, they kind of intermingle with each other and do business with each other, you can make one application and disclose that on the application process and make sure you're substantiating the uh, full expense of all three entities in there and making sure that loan officer has that information. So the loan officer then can reach back out to you and say, we need X, Y, and Z from you in order to finish this or process your loan further. All right. Uh, an LLC owner, uh, it's a husband and wife. They don't draw a paycheck. They just get personal draws. Does this cover their personal draws? Uh, I would say it could. You know, in the original text, there was a look back on trying to set this payroll period and compare it to payroll in 2019. Uh, so let's... Um, I would say I would apply and use that as the philosophy. Uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would look at 2019, you know, and compare it to 2020. What do you think, Edward, on something like that? I agree. I think, I think that's where we have some uh, uh, unclear uh, wording uh, that, that's there. And I think uh, independent contractors and, and those pass-through entities are, are pretty uh, well stated, uh, but they don't specifically address exactly that situation. So I would let, uh, I would let somebody tell me no before I told myself no on that situation. Yeah, I agree completely. All right, does the cap of $100,000 on an employee include their health benefits or compensation only? Well, I read it to mean an annual pay rate of up to 100. So those benefit pieces are in addition to that is the way I would read it. Um, so the way they define payroll costs, it's, it's that annual rate of pay. So you can't include somebody's annual rate of pay over $100,000, but if they have, you know, their benefits and insurance premiums could be included is the way I read it. All right. Uh, and this is a question from a banker. So from their point of view, do you know yet what obligations the banks will have on verifying submitted information or can we completely rely on, rely on the borrower's certification? Great yeah. question. 
<laughs> well, and from what I'm seeing, a lot of it is relying on that borrower certification statement. Those are the, the first statements that the SBA asks when it takes uh, the loan application. Uh, and I know there's also some verbiage in there about uh, substantiating uh, your, your payments uh, with the proceeds of the loan. So I'll stop there and I'll let French address uh, the rest of that if he wants to. No, I, Edward, I think that's right. And that's one reason why I've always considered why it says may be forgivable. I mean, the the borrower is going to have to substantiate, document, and certify, you know, that the amounts submitted to the bank qualify uh, for this credit and qualify when it comes time to asking for forgiveness. Um, but I think in the rules that are going to come out from Treasury that'll be the guidance on this, I think that part will be pretty clear. I mean, they'll want to make that as straightforward as possible, both for that banker and for the borrower. Right. And I think that's a great point as, as we're still waiting on Treasury. And so SBA is working with Treasury in order to make sure that we have guidance on exactly how the banks are to implement this and the requirements that they're going to need uh, from both SBA and the and the uh, banking perspective to be successful. All right. Any specific options for startup companies that don't currently have revenue? If you have expenses and, and uh, you've started a business and, and you, you can prove those expenses, then you're eligible to apply. There's, again, uh, on that option, if you've incurred the expense and COVID-19 has impacted uh, your startup, then you're still considered a business that, that started and had a negative impact from this uh, coronavirus. So yes, absolutely apply. All right. What are the details of the FICA deferral option? Do I just instruct my payroll company? A uh, good question. If you have a payroll company and most all businesses, big, you know, anybody has a substantial number of employees uses a payroll company, I would email your payroll contact now on what their plan is for instructions on that deferral on the start date uh, and uh, how to comply with it. I would definitely go that direction. And if you don't have a payroll company, I'd consult with your accountant on how to uh, trigger that deferral. All right. As the owner of a business that owns multiple properties, can the loans be used to make up for lost rent from tenants that have lost their job? If so, which loan product and what would be the requirements to show that you have lost the rent? So we're, we're taking those as uh, economic injury disaster loans right now. Um, your, your overhead expenses uh, are part of that. You substantiate your lost rents. There's some specific uh, questions in the application that asks about uh, lessors um, and, and they can absolutely uh, apply for a loan through us uh, at the EIDL level. Uh, you can talk to your banker as well about deferring your existing if you have uh, existing payments with them. Uh, what was the second part of that question there? Go back to it. Uh, so yeah, you've answered that. If, if so, okay. what product uh, you would recommend and then what would be the requirements to show that you've lost the rent? Yeah, uh, for lost rent, uh, there's a portion on it. You, one of the forms in there, this is if you've lost rent, uh, you can substantiate that. Uh, and if there's not, and you don't see that specific area, make sure you put that in the open comment section in there so they have an idea of the uh, the impact to your business on that. But yes, this is a one of those unique times where SBA normally doesn't do um, uh, rental properties. Uh, passive rental uh, is what it's generally considered, and SBA doesn't lend on that. Well, uh, SBA is that's eligible under the Economic Injury Disaster Loan uh, Program as well. All right. Uh, this is uh, on rehiring. Do we have to rehire the layoffs for the loan forgiveness to qualify for forgiveness? If so, how soon do we have to rehire? Good question. Uh, I think the guidance is going to be very helpful on this. As a general statement, yes, you would have to rehire them to count them in this payroll amount that you're then going to seek forgiveness for. Um, because that's the whole purpose of the loan is to keep people on your payroll through this loan that you don't have to pay back. That's hundred percent guaranteed by the government instead of putting them out on the unemployment 
insurance system. Given the fact that this is a short run uh, public health crisis rather than some, you know, economic originating crisis. So that's the logic behind it. So yeah, you've got to hire them back. And I, I think that date is uh, June 30th. There is is um, where where the end date on that's going to be. So uh, I think that in from the federal government perspective, you got two ways: either uh, we're going to sit. Uh, support them through unemployment insurance benefits, or we're going to support them through the payroll act. Uh, I kind of see those as being the two means uh, in order to help uh, out during this crisis. All right. And then uh, someone was asking if credit unions will take part as lenders. Yes. yes. It's been covered by saying everyone, everyone will, will be able to take part as a lender for the most part. Right. Someone asked, uh, as I was scrolling and I've lost it, but it was generally uh, someone asking whether they are disqualified because they take uh, Medicare, Medicaid payments as part of their business from an SBA loan. You mean they are uh, have revenue coming in from Medicare, Medicaid, Medicaid? I believe that was it. One second, let me get back to it. But um, I didn't know if that was one that you'd know off the top of your head without. I, I would generally say no. I mean, if they're a Medicare contractor, uh, you know, and they've, this is again about their employment base. Are they, have they still got their revenue? Is to, have they still got their employees? Um, you know, I guess it's, it's into that justification of what are you borrowing the money for, but I don't know that they're disqualified. What do you think, Edward? Yeah, so I would say absolutely on that. We're going to look at all sources uh, of income or uh, grants or assistance to the business. Uh, SBA would definitely assess um, who receive Medicaid funds. Uh, is it is it earned revenue or is this a grant fund? I think when we look at that, SBA is going to consider all sources of income and all sources of assistance to the business um, in order to grant an application or approve an application from that. So uh, depending upon what kind of Medicaid funds you're getting and, and what those uh, what type of funds they are is going to dictate a lot on that situation. So apply and, and talk to the loan officer about that. All right. If anybody uh, who's watching and you asked a question that hasn't been answered, then um, go ahead and ask it again at the bottom and scroll. There are a lot on here and I've been scrolling and hope to, uh, I think I've gotten to most of them, particularly the general ones. Uh, here's one thing. I've got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, Congressman, um, we have, and Jay of course knows this as well. And I, I know you do too. We've got over 600 restaurants in, in Little Rock alone. And many of them over the last two weeks have laid off all of their all of their wait staff. So I'm curious, relative to this eight weeks forgivable loan, in order to qualify for that, they've got to get rehired, even though none of us can go to the restaurants and, and spend our money. Yep. So is the forgivable loan gonna can that be done for rent and mortgage payments and and other things and and for some reduced amount of of um, in, of uh, restaurant staff that are there doing the takeout? Um, I think independent the, of independent of those contract employees that are hourly. Yeah, I think so. Um, and the reason I say that is because in the uh, exchange stabilization fund lending for the big businesses, right? They have <laughs> they have a specific prohibition on reducing staff. You have to keep staff levels, I think, at ninety percent of pre-COVID impact or something like that. And I don't think Edward that we have that requirement in the SBA piece that they have a specific. So we're real sensitive to that. And I hate that people just go on the unemployment system, uh, which is very generous. Uh, it runs till uh, the end of July. But uh, I think a restaurant entrepreneur who wanted to keep a core group going and keep rent paid and keep a, uh, a fun takeout business that's not necessarily profitable, but it would be for these eight weeks. You know, if yeah. you didn't have to eat the expenses of overhead of keeping it going, um, yeah, I think they would. I would encourage them to apply, even though they've quote as you say furloughed or or laid off their their wait staff and their and their 
a lot of their kitchen staff. Yeah, Thank you. and I, uh, Mark, I'm also I'm, I'm hoping that uh, with additional guidance that we receive, that should clarify a lot of the questions uh, that we are having uh, on very specific cases, and and hopefully bring a little bit more clarity to this as as it unfolds. Yeah, thank you, Ed. Thank you, thank you, Congressman. You all right, got several questions uh, that have just come in, all related to uh, 1099 employees, contract labor, and yeah. the application to what you pay those folks. Yeah, well, this is gets back to Edward's comments about certification and past practices. I would be showing a 1099 independent contractor employee, be showing them kind of what they made during the same period last year or maybe what they're annualizing between January and February 15th before uh, this crisis began and come up with a, a, a justifiable logic about how to put them in for this eight week uh, annual rate of pay area because we wanna keep our tipped workers eligible. We wanna keep our independent contractors and our gig workers eligible, but I acknowledge that that's not always uh, obvious what that pay rate's going to be. What do you, Edward, do you think that's about right for that? Yeah, I, I think there's, you know, it, it comes into uh, some internal uh, business practices. Uh, obviously, if you've been sending out 1099s on the regular, you'll be able to substantiate uh, the cost of these employees or these, these contractors over a longer term. I think you're going to have some uh, individualized uh, scenarios in, in that case where if you have a, you think maybe an outlier unique situation i would go ahead and and write a, a, a short narrative to explain that and submit that along with your application to sba i think that'll help bring some clarity around why you think you've had direct impact and, and how this applies that always helps the loan officer make the right decision and that's what you're trying to do is help get them to yes rather than uh, prevent them or, or help them say no right so if you have those things lay it out for them in, in, a, in a brief summary that you can add into your loan application and give them some support to say yes with okay uh, if you're making rental payments to an affiliated entity are those payments eligible to be forgiven the, the, the loan for those payments. I, I think that's going to be a structure issue if you're, you know, and I'll, I'll throw some government ease. If you're an EPCOC or a, a passive company with an operating company, there, there might be some room for that. Uh, I would go ahead and make the application and let the loan officer uh, tell you that it's ineligible rather than you self ineligible being, you know, taking yourself out of the mix. Okay. If a person elects to stay home because they're a high risk due to age or pre-existing condition, are they eligible for sick leave benefits? The question is for people who have not been specifically instructed to self-isolate. Uh, that's an employee practice issue at a local business. Uh, I would say that the intent of the bill that Congress passed was is that if a uh, employee is staying home and they're asking for paid sick leave because of the coronavirus or the fear of coronavirus that's between their themselves and their employer but if the employer agrees that would be a a expense that the government would help pay for that would be my interpretation but that's a super technical question in a local business with a local employee with i would consult your hr uh leadership on that but that's that's i'd say the intent by the uh, family and medical leave portion of the bill, not this bill, but the previous bill that Congress passed. And I see, uh, Buckley, there's a question in there for microloans, and I know we haven't really touched on that. That's uh, a, a nonprofit intermediary that SBA loans money to and, and really makes small dollar loans out in the community, uh, starting at anywhere from $500 up to 50,000. And right now, um, we haven't had the guidance on how those microloans will be addressed in any loan forgiveness. Uh, they should be included in most, uh, and that's speculation, but we're waiting on guidance on how the micro borrowers uh, will, will be able to um, really use uh, any deferrals or forgiveness uh, as guidance comes out. All right, and this is slightly different from the 1099 question, but, but also similar. In addition to core employees, are employees hired through a staffing agency included? 
Uh, that's I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Yeah. It's a good question. I don't know. I think that's a um, that's something I, I the, the 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 company and that staffing company ought to discuss that and think through that. All right. What about self-employed individuals? And this person specifically says they're not a part of the SBA system. What's available to someone who's self-employed? So self-employed people are covered by the act and sole proprietors. This was a specific broadening that Congress put in this act to be as generous as possible to um, the gig economy, as well as the just traditional self-employed person. They're also eligible for the unemployment insurance, which is not typically the case either. Uh, so this bill is pretty generous. I would, um, Check in with your accountant on that or uh, your advisor, but as a general statement, a self-employed person is eligible for applying for one of these loans. All right, uh, procedural question here. For the CARE Act, if they're taking an average of the payroll costs for the months of March 2019 to February 2020, how does it affect you if you added salaried employees in late 2019 and early 2020? Well, that I've read three different versions of this 880 page bill and uh, Edward and I were talking about this earlier. The calculation on the payroll piece has changed in those three versions between eight weeks and 2.5 times the average of last year. I think we need to wait and see the guidance, but if your business model has changed and you've added a bunch of employees late in the year, that needs to be recognized. So I would show the 2019 calculation <clears throat> and then I'd show the January and February calculation of 2020 as part of my justification for why you've uh, recommended the, the amount. Yeah, and, and I, I would say, I think there's gonna be some additional guidance that comes out uh, with that. So uh, our lenders can help substantiate um, lending around that as well. Okay. Uh, I have one entity, one tax ID with two hotel locations. Will the idle advance loan be available to each location as each location has separate payroll, mortgage, et cetera? You would submit both of that. If it's one entity, two locations, you would submit all of that in, into one application. Right. But yes, both, both locations would be eligible or the total costs of the business would be eligible. Uh, do we know how the 500 employee figure will be computed at the time of loan application, the number of W-2s issued in the prior year or a look back period? Uh, so traditionally SBA uses NACE code and it's on a three year average. Uh, so that's what they're gonna be looking at for size standard uh, for full, full time equivalents over, over a three year trend. Uh, you can reach out to me directly at my office or, or my staff at SBA in order to, to go through any size standard questions you do have. Are self-employed able to apply for unemployment? Yes. Yes. Okay. Can you apply for unemployment and additionally for one of these loans? Uh, that's more complicated. Uh, I'd say that's definitely not the intent. I think it, the intent is one or the other, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. This gets into, you know, if somebody uh, has been furloughed, they file for unemployment. They have unemployment for three weeks in a row, for example. And then their boss calls them and says, hey, I have a PPP loan. I want you to come back. In that instance, you know, they would, if they wanted to, uh, give up the unemployment and go back to the employer. That would be one way that could work. But as a self-employed person, no, you would not. I don't think the intent, a self-employed person would try to apply for both. All right. Uh, we process payroll for our client and they reimburse us. Do we apply for that loan or should we uh, supply them with the reports? You process payroll for, if, if you're a business that has suffered direct impact uh, from COVID-19, 
you can apply directly. Uh, if, if you have not, then you're supporting other businesses that it would be applying, I would assume, if I read that one correctly. Uh, this is a, a change of, of uh, type of business here on the question. Five years, after five years, we've converted from an LLC to an S Corp in January of this year. However, it was retroactive back to January 2019. We're caught in the middle without having a 2019 taxes completed yet. Any advice on how to move forward with the EIBL? Um, I would suggest the it's, it's particular question uh, apply. Uh, put that information in there and, and notice to the loan officer, uh, describe on a short narrative what the difference is going to be. Make sure you substantiate your losses uh, and then that loan officer or a case manager will reach out to you and ask you for any additional information they need. All right, at this point, I think we've covered everything uh, that, that uh, the, the rest of the questions I think are just duplicative. Um, Home-based businesses, I see a couple questions in there. Home-based businesses are eligible. Uh, again, apply uh, with any loss um, and, and overhead you would have. That doesn't necessarily mean uh, your mortgage costs are going to be covered, but substantiate the costs you do have uh, that are direct business costs. Apply for the loan and your loan officer can, can help you on those individual uh, questions there for our home-based businesses. Edward, in that regard, earlier today, we also had the question about uh, someone using their vehicle as their office because they're constantly uh, out doing whatever it is they're doing. Would, would the cost of that vehicle also be a part of their operational expense? You know, I would say if it's routinely, uh, usually uh, and routinely used for business, I, I would put it forward. Uh, if it's essential in the operation of your business, I would definitely put it in there as an expense and, and let SBA uh, decline it or, or screen it out as an ineligible expense. But at least you're putting it forward in there. You're, you're showing them the full picture and let them make the decision. Okay. All right. So we just had a few more come in. Um, if you've not yet suffered a direct impact, can you still apply? That's where I think, uh, back to uh, the Congressman's statement earlier, I think this is a great time for you to really be kind of preparing uh, all your, your ducks and get them in a row uh, and see how things uh, come up in the next uh, week or so. Uh, and then yeah, I think, uh, what is your expectation in suffering? Um, any direct impact? Uh, then I would, I would definitely apply at that point. And that also harkens back to the Congressman's point about if you get to June, you can look backwards, can you not? There are some provisions in there, yes, absolutely. Okay. All right, if a company is not classified as a small business by federal standards, but they're less than 500 employee, employees, do they qualify? Yeah, so uh, a small business classification is based on the NAICS code, N-A-I-C-S of a business. Uh, generally, it's either a revenue-based um, or it is uh, revenue-based or employee-based. So I would say you can always reach out to, uh, to me in my office, um, uh, either edward.haddock at sba.gov uh, or give us a call and, and we can get your specific questions on employee size standards answered. All right. Can we apply for more than the eight weeks expenses amount? How is the max loan determined? Uh, absolutely. So uh, you're, you're going to, there is no, this is a one application where there's no box to select uh, how much your money you're looking for. Uh, so SBA determines that based on the information that you put forward. Um, and so that's how uh, your max loan will be determined. And, and they're looking to extend up to six months of working capital to the business. Uh, that's the goal for the EIDL loans. Now, as we move forward and, and do the triple P loans, I think you're gonna see uh, a bit different um, underwriting process and, and each individual lender is gonna be able to bring some um, decision-making process forward and how they're dispersing and determining th those expenses and, and the amount of the loan. All right, a new question here at the bottom regarding the payroll process for clients. Since we hold a W-2 and FEIN for employees of our clients, particularly property management, 
would we include that payroll with our real estate business? That's the bottom okay. question. I would. Regarding the payroll process. I would, uh, you know, I, I give you a good 1-800 number uh, direct for our disaster folks that you can call and, and, and ask that specific question for. That's a unique situation uh, where uh, really the loan processor is going to be able to tell you. And I, I, I tell you, Office of Disaster Assistance would tell you apply, put that in there and let them uh, either de defer it out or, or uh, follow up with you to get more information. Um, let me make sure I go ahead and, and put the uh, the one eight hundred number uh, into the chat box. So everyone has that um, and can uh, contact the um, Office of Disaster Assistance directly. And that's really where you're going to be able to get your very specific answers uh, to your very specific problems or questions that you have in this uh, application process. All right, and while you're typing that in, I uh, just had a question, a uh, private question asking if a recording of this is available. Uh, so in addition to this being available on the Chamber's Facebook page where we've been streaming it live uh, and it will, will be there permanently, uh, we will also email out a, uh, a link to an audio file. Uh, so it'll be audio only, uh, but for those of you that registered or taking part in this, we can send that as a follow-up to where you can listen to it for those of you who don't have uh, a Facebook page. And Edward, you just posted all that contact info. I'm also going to uh, drop a link in here uh, for our uh, SBA um, daily updates. Uh, my staff sends out a, a, twice a, a twice a day update. So as things change, as of course, we're all expecting things to do, um, we will update um, and send updates via that newsletter uh, twice a day in order to make sure individuals have uh, access to the most current information as this thing moves forward again. Uh, at this point, we're almost going hourly in the changes, uh, especially on some of the application sites for the uh, SBA. Um, and you can uh, check in with us on, on a daily basis to find what's new and what's changed uh, through this system. So I'll go ahead and link that in to the chat as well. Thank you. So a couple of more questions before we wrap up that I see just came in, Buckley. Yeah, yeah. if our business mortgage payment has been deferred, uh, are we able to receive the interest portion from the PPP loan? Yeah, again, that's, that's uh, even if you have deferrals, uh, that interest portion is eligible as a, an expense for the PPP and the EIDL. All right. And then uh, if I had one that was a little further up, I just saw again. So I want to ask you where they can find a copy of the final bill, or which is now the act. Uh, I think we have it out on our website, but they can uh, send that inquiry to hill.house.gov. I'll send you a file and let's put it on the chamber site. Yeah, we can do that. And, and I know I've seen it, so I can find where uh, a yeah, link. I've got the bill and I've got the bill summary. We'll send that to you, Buckley, and you can post Great. it. We will, I'll include that, uh, we'll put that on the Chamber site, and then we'll also include a link to that in this email I discussed sending out that will that will include the audio file link. So Congressman Edward, we've now been out at this for an hour and 26 minutes, and we cannot thank you enough, not only for the time today, but uh, Edward with your time as well last week. And obviously, as we know, going forward, um, as, as changes occur, we're going to be uh, trying to keep these folks to, abreast of those changes as best we can. But thank you, thank you, thank you for the time that you've given to uh, the business community here in Little Rock and Central Arkansas today. We really appreciate you. Please keep your chin up. Please keep fighting for us as we fight together to uh, overcome this, 
this virus and move this economy forward. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Congressman. Thanks, Congressman. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. All right.